be here now. Just be here now. As a therapist, I realize that I always sit with at least two more generations mm. in the room. Patients, their parents, and their grandparents, at least. I, I think often it's even more than that. Welcome to the Meta Hour with Sharon Salzberg, where Buddhist wisdom meets everyday life. This podcast is brought to you by the Be Here Now Network and features interviews with the top leaders, teachers, and thinkers of the mindfulness movement and beyond. For more information, visit BeHereNowNetwork.com backslash Sharon. Hi, I'm Sharon Salzberg, and today I'm talking with Dr. Galit Atlas. Galit is a psychoanalyst and clinical supervisor in private practice in Manhattan. She's a clinical assistant professor on the New York University postdoctoral program in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis faculty. As an essayist and author, Galit has published numerous articles and book chapters that focus primarily on gender and sexuality. Her New York Times publication, A Tale of Two Twins, won a 2016 Gardiva Award. Her latest book, Emotional Inheritance, a Therapist, Her Patients, and the Legacy of Trauma was released in January of 2022 and entwines the stories of her patients, her own stories, and decades of research to help us identify the links between our life struggles and the emotional inheritance we all carry. Welcome to the Meta Hour, Galit. Thank you so much, Sharon. I'm so glad to be here with you today. Well, a big congratulations on the release of your book. Um, Where are you recording from today? Thank you. I am in New York City in my bedroom where I actually see patients virtually from, from here. And before we get into the book, I'd love to hear more about what drew you to psychology and a little bit more about your own journey. In the book, I talk about my research which is my me search. Mm -hmm. And it's always a term I like, my me search, to think about how through everything I do, I look for myself. So psychology, I, I was a patient first when I was in my 20s. And I still remember when I came back for my first session with my therapist back then, I think I was 21 or 22. And she asked me uh, the question that I asked many times since, why are you here? And it was a shocking question because I had no idea. And I remembered and I thought to myself, how come I, I came to therapy, but I actually don't know why. And, and I think since then, a lot of what I do um, is ask, even in my own process, of course, and with patients, is try to form questions, even more important than finding the answers. Mm-hmm. Or finding like, why? What am I doing here? What is? And I think this is what really led me to become a psychoanalyst and to psychology and to study the unconscious and to and to look and search for, for questions first and sometimes find answers. Uh, it's usually not the answers you think you're going to find. And to help other people in that mm-hmm. really fascinating journey. Well, mental health has become a much more mainstream conversation This past decade, I was actually thinking, you know, I don't even remember when I was younger hearing the term mental health. It was all mental illness, you know, and and, uh, with a variety of of different uh, shades of emotion. But um, even that part seems new. Yeah. It changed a lot, right? And I do have to say, I think 
uh, during COVID, something really radical changed in the way we think about mental health. Mm. Um, and I think for better and for worse, I mean, uh, the bad news is that it was a very, very, very challenging time and it, and it still is. Yeah. And uh, the silver lining maybe there is that we started talking about mental health mm-hmm. and dealing with the stigma of mental health. And because everybody were in the same place together, mm-hmm. parents and children and therapists and patients, and I'm sure for you too, like mm-hmm. your buddies together, we're together in this and we're trying to figure it out. Well, it's interesting, you know, being somebody who was in contact with so many people, all virtual. Um, I hardly saw anybody for two years, you know, but uh, in person. But I was, you know, living on Zoom and, um, you know, just seeing almost like the uh, the waves, you know, how it might have started with anxiety and then there was so much grief and there was anger and then exhaustion and, and just a, a kind of collective experience obviously we had different experiences as well in terms of intensity and right. loss and, and so on you know but um it's been a lot and it's been a lot for a long time yeah the pandemic made trauma something we can talk about right mm-hmm. and and not only trauma i mean mental health in general and i think you're right there is a lot of there are many many layers mm-hmm. of stress and 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 anxiety and loss. I think loss is is something that we will know in the future how right how to process mm-hmm. so many layers of loss. Everybody lost something. Yeah. Either right, either a person in their lives, or uh, their community, or their or money, or. You know, at something we lost. Everybody lost at least something. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, so many layers, as you say. Let, let's start with talking about the stigma. Do you think that there's less stigma because yeah. there's such a collective experience? Yeah, I think there is less stigma. You could see it in popular culture, right? You could see how. There are more books on, on mental health. Uh, well-known people talk about their mental health uh, journeys and struggles, and and it's and it's out there. So people are less um, ashamed mm-hmm. of talking about it. And you see it even in schools. You know, I have young children, and my youngest is uh, twelve, and she comes home and she says, "Well, we talk about our anxiety and our." Depression and our, wow. <laughs> which is really impressive, right? That yeah. children they have the language for it because, and I think some of it is is also popular culture. It's in the culture. It's in it's everywhere, and the children are they they have language that we didn't have as children. Yeah, definitely. And I'm wondering, you know, I've I've been writing, and I was just recently writing about uh, trauma, and so I mm-hmm. asked several. Uh, therapist that I know. How do you define trauma? And everyone said I can't define it. I know. <laughs> you know, so I'm about to ask you. You know, it, it, this is a very difficult question. I think there are a lot of um, arguments about how to define trauma. Uh, I think the basic thing about trauma it's is that it is an overwhelming event or experience, right? And the difference between event. Or, or experiences that an event could be one sudden shocking thing, like a sudden loss, mm-hmm. car accident, a rape. Mm-hmm. 9-11 was an event, right? Mm-hmm. Or an experience, an ongoing experience, like abuse, neglect, racism, right? It's trauma. Mm-hmm. So in the book, I discuss all of those experiences from, and from capital T trauma to small t trauma and the way they appear in the next generation's mind, right? But I think the definition of trauma, it also is changing. We're talking about the culture and how we talk about trauma. I think the definition of trauma is is changing as well. So in your book, your new book, Emotional Inheritance, A Therapist, Her Patients, and the Legacy of Trauma, you have three different sections. You have inherited trauma, 
from past generations, trauma from our parents, and breaking the cycle. So what was the impetus for you to focus on family-based trauma for this book? You know, as a therapist, I, and I'm sure you can relate to that, you sit with a person, and the more experience I have with patients, the more I realize that I always sit with at least two more generations. Mm. In the room. Patients, their parents, and their grandparents, at least. I, I think often it's even more than that. And that underneath many emotional struggles, there is an emotional inheritance and attachment to our parents, the way we grew up, of course, which is the more uh, traditional psychoanalytic uh, perspective of how we connect past, present, and future, uh, but also who our parents were, not only what they did to us or what was said or done, but also who are these parents mm -hmm. that shaped us, right? And how do we understand them? How do we understand the nature of our attachment to them? And how do they live inside of us? And so the, the, the book is divided really to these three parts. In the first part, I talk about our grandparents and have really these stories about grandparents and grandchildren and the ways it's, it's mostly on trauma, the first part, the way a grandparent's trauma, even if the grandchild didn't know about it, lives inside them and they, they react to it in some ways. The second part is on our parents and their secrets, things that they didn't tell us or things that they tried not to talk about or didn't want us to know or didn't want themselves to know or think about and how that impacts us. And the third part is called Secrets We Keep From Ourselves. And of course, that is already about us. And if we have a next generation, the next generation as well. That's fantastic. It's fascinating. I and mean, there are so many secrets often in families and a lot of shame. And um, maybe you could say something about the influence this has on, on the trauma that might not otherwise be so much at play when things are more spoken about or more acknowledged. Right. You know, it's interesting. It's a very good question because the truth is that the relation between trauma and secrets is, is bidirectional. What I mean by that is that there is trauma because of secrets and there is secrets because of trauma. Mm -hmm. And very often we used to think, that, at least traditionally, psychoanalysts used to think that secrets are usually around two topics who, you know, Freud used to say, our people are the most hypocritical about, and that is sex and money. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can talk about that. And in the book, I actually, in the last chapter, I talk about, about sex and money as, as, you know, source of secrets and how it is related to family, the, the legacy of secrets in family and shame. But the truth is that one of the, things that is the most shameful and is trauma. Mm -hmm. Therefore, a lot, a lot of the secrets that families carry is related to the, uh, some history of trauma, to some trauma that victims are ashamed of. We are ashamed of being, of being victims. Mm -hmm. Very shameful position. And I think that's what uh, psychologists... And, uh, you know, mental health people really try to focus on and help people with their shame. Well, certainly, you know, there were many secrets in my family my growing up. And uh, one of the residues I've seen is that I have a kind of sensitivity, like if I'm watching the news on television and it seems to me that the political person speaking is, is lying, is, is mm -hmm. being deceitful in some way. Yes. Uh, I, that is really intense for me, you know. I understand that, and I, I understand what you're saying is that these authority figures that are supposed to protect us, yeah, they lie to us. That is very scary. 
Yeah, it led me to having much better boundaries about watching the news, which was a good thing. Yeah. Because I realized that this is affecting me too too much. You know, this is like, this is really yeah. difficult. And, and uh, it's just fascinating, you know, because the um, – uh, I, I imagine generations before mm -hmm. uh, were not necessarily acting out of malice, you know? It was just like, this is how things were. I also came from a family where, as I've often said, like, the word cancer was never said except in a whisper. Right, right. You know, and when I've gone to oncology wards and different hospitals to teach, and I catch myself tempted to whisper, I think that is crazy, <laughs> you know, like... <laughs> They know what their patients have, um, you know. They but need to be able to have uh, to be able to talk, right? Yeah, yeah. I came from a similar family, right, to yours. Mm -hmm. and that in my family, uh, everybody had to be um, optimistic and happy. Mm -hmm. And my parents did not want to talk about trauma. Mm -hmm. They didn't tell us about uh, their trauma. And they, both of my parents experienced uh, loss when they were children. My mother, I mentioned it in the book, one of the chapters, that my mother lost her older brother when mm. she was born and he was 14. We knew that. It was not a secret in our family. Mm. But, but we knew that we cannot talk about it because we knew that my mother is very emotional about it and she could, we, we wanted to protect her from that. And other things were more of, again, uh, secrets. We could, it depends how we define secrets. But often secrets are not just things we don't know. It's also things that are, you know, kept hidden in mm -hmm. a certain mm -hmm. way, right? We are not allowed to talk about them. And we don't even know what was real and what is not, what we make up and what actually happened. And, and we're not allowed to ask. And... Mm -hmm. About, at least in my family, talk about things that were unpleasant. Yeah. And, yeah. Right? I just had this really uh, funny thought because at the time that we are recording this, um, like the number one hit song uh, in the world is We Don't Talk About Bruno from the movie Encanto. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it is about a family member who they all have magical powers except for one girl. And uh, his power was to predict the future, and people mm -hmm. didn't like what he said, and so he was he was shunned. Although everyone talked about him, but never in front of certain people, you know. And so, yeah. uh, and it's kind of a it's been a mystery in a way why that particular song has taken over the world. Because mm -hmm. if you haven't seen the movie, which is an animated movie, and about family intergenerational trauma, actually. Uh, it, it doesn't yeah, always it, make that much sense, but then I'm just thinking, oh, it's reaching all these children, you know, who are like mm -hmm. feeling it and they don't know how to say it in another way. Yeah, that's incredible, you know. I haven't seen this movie, but I yeah. heard yeah, yeah. from people who read the book, my book, and they said, have you seen this movie? Mm -hmm. It's exactly about that. Mm. And it is about generational trauma. And yeah. so uh, is that right? That's you, how, the way you experienced it. Yeah. Well. And it's also, you know, the um, the trauma in, in a way is also world events, you know, like a mm -hmm. war or uh, which is what in, in the movie, you know, it was it was um, it takes place in Colombia. And so there's there's a lot of history there, you know, of uh, violence and bloodshed and, and so on. And other things as well, the beautiful, warm, yeah. wonderful things that are are highly displayed. But interestingly enough, they didn't ignore the the difficulty. And it's a lot about intergenerational trauma and uh, as everyone's living in the same house. And uh, I think it, it would be quite wonderful for you to see it and, and see the similarities. Because there's also, you know, the phrase these days at any rate of post-traumatic growth. Yeah. And that very delicate balance of honoring the pain of a situation or a, an inheritance and at the same time feeling, I don't want to be defined by this. Although there's a balance there too. Like when I wrote this book, Real Love, 
and turned in the manuscript to my publisher. He responded by saying, I really like the book. And my favorite passage, actually, uh, my favorite part is when you quoted Roshi Joan Halifax, who's a Zen teacher, mm-hmm. a friend of mine, when you quoted Roshi Joan, who said something like, don't try to force yourself to see the traumas of your past as gifts. They are givens. Hmm. And I thought that was a tremendous reprieve, although I did see the irony of my own publisher saying that his favorite part of my book I didn't even write. Yeah. <laughs> I was just quoting no. <laughs> I was just quoting Roshi Chow. Um, yeah. yeah. But I hear what you're saying. It's also something about the balance between what defines us and how we are uh, the, the two extremes, right? Of mm-hmm. defining ourselves. Um, are the pain defining us on one hand, right? Or go, and going towards pain on the other. Mm-hmm. And I think that is true for Buddhism. And tell me if I'm right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it is definitely true for therapy when there is this uh, dialectic tension between what you know, what we want to change and what we want to accept, mm-hmm. and what we. And in the book, I talk about what we would like to. Uh, repair versus what we need to mourn because there are things in life that we cannot repair. Mm-hmm. We can only accept and mourn. And so I think that is um, part of that about about when it comes to pain, right? How much it defines us and how much we, this is who we are uh, versus how much we try to avoid it. I'm thinking about what you were just saying um, to let something, I mean, when, we, when it comes to brain and trauma, what we see is that uh, we don't necessarily have to force anything. We just have to allow something that exists uh, to come and to, to, right, to, have, to, have, to have access to that if we can. And would you say that um, like forgiving yourself for what you feel, having compassion for yourself, um, no matter what your experience is, is plays a, a strong role in that healing? Definitely. It's one of the, the most important things, right, is to really be our own uh, good, uh, in psychoanalysis we call it good object. What does that mean? It means those, those parents, right, that internalized parents, that we, we, we all need that parent that says, don't worry about it. You're you're good. You know, mm. it's fine. You and I'm not. Talk, I don't mean by that everything is good and everything is going to be okay. Mm-hmm. You know, but somebody that is with you when things are not always okay. Mm-hmm. But, but you, that there is a voice, and I think that's what you were saying about forgiving yourself, mm-hmm. uh, accepting yourself, looking at yourself, and and I think that's part of therapy therapeutic, good enough therapeutic work. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's really about people come to therapy and they say, I want to change myself, right? And I, and I always think like, okay, let, let's talk about that. What is it that you want to change? And you find a lot of self-hate underneath the wish to change yourself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And part of the therapeutic work is to really find that delicate balance between what you want to change, what you can change right there are things we cannot change yeah yeah. and what you accept and have compassion towards and and even love Mm -hmm. yeah that's that's very true um and very very important to i think hold as a context in many ways it is the context for the therapy itself isn't it that is people are disclosing or unearthing or highlighting uh, yeah. whatever and it's being received in an environment you know that is forgiving and compassionate and-, and understanding from inside I think one of the things that many 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 people I want to say all people but I'm not sure I think there are some people that don't did not don't frame it that way mm-hmm. there is as children is loneliness mm-hmm. I'm feeling that you have parents, and even if your parents are really loving and your siblings are really loving, somehow uh, you process the world alone. 
And there is something very, you know, very painful about that for many people, the, the loneliness of childhood and, and the lack of that voice that says, you know, you're, I'm, I understand you. Mm-hmm. And so when I'm thinking about, about being with someone and being from, uh, you know, accompanying them, but actually being inside them in some ways, it is not being, it's the opposite of what people sometimes think about therapy, that therapists are there to give you a reality check, right? Mm-hmm. Of, of how you, you know, how you're doing and if it's good or bad or, or give you guidance or advice. Mm-hmm. Which, to me, that is really not uh, the work, right? Uh, what we're doing and what people, I believe, need, uh, what I need, right? What you need, what we all need is somebody that will help us. We will be on our side and help us understand why do we feel the way we feel? Mm-hmm. What do we need? Really, what is it? Right? How do we sit with ourselves and with others? Which in a way brings me back to this particular time of COVID and where um, that loneliness, you know, is so strong for so many people and a yeah. sense of isolation. And even if you were working outside the home and even if you were, um, you know, living in a situation that uh, had, you know, large households of many generations or whatever, um, so much was gone in terms of our normal outlets for resilience or just fun or, you know, whatever. Yeah. And and uh, it's been such a, a profoundly lonely time for a lot of people. Yeah, totally. Very lonely, and, and it evoked a lot of fear of people. Mm-hmm. See it in the world, right? People, we even, even I, I would say it's unconscious, even more than conscious, because people wouldn't tell you, oh, I'm afraid of people, yeah. right? But I think that underneath, even knowing that there is some virus there that we could, you know, something might happen. And I see it with, with children as well. There was a lot of guilt um, in children mm. uh, during COVID. And now I think as, as things get a little better, and especially as COVID is not, you know, is not something that's for sure is going to kill you, mm-hmm. that, that mm-hmm. goes down. But for a long time, children were very, very, very afraid mm. of hurting their parents by accident. Especially if you think about it, children also have negative feelings about their parents. So that doesn't allow it mm-hmm. when you think that if you have, if you will have any negative th- feeling towards your parents, especially with teenagers, you see that, uh, and something might happen to them because you're actually f- worried about them in a real, mm-hmm. in a way. Uh, that that does something to your to your development, right? Mm-hmm. It really does not allow you to fully separate, to fully have have a layer of, of negativity, mm-hmm. which is important. It's like you know, so people talk about secrets, and I always and they say they say to me, "So, do you think people should not have secrets?" And I always said, you know, secrets are also important developmentally, especially for children. It is a real problem if your child does not keep any secret from you. It, it is important for children to know that they have their own mind, that you can't read their mind, that they can hide things in their mind. And in that sense, they, are, they have a self, right? There's so much in, in Buddhist teaching about um, kind of the, some people call it the innate goodness within everyone. Or uh, one of my teachers called it the the innate okayness within everyone <laughs> that that there is uh, something whole or there's something um, that isn't quite so uh, affected mm-hmm. even by these very deep losses mm-hmm. or things that that come and go and so I'm just thinking about the process of psychotherapy or you know sitting in a room with somebody. Uh, in that role where, um, in a way, is there a kind of implicit acknowledgement that there is that, you know, that, I don't know if place may not be the right word, but Mm -hmm. that potential no matter what? 
You know, there is an acknowledgement, and I'm not again. I'm not sure it's a it's a, a explicit acknowledgement mm-hmm. that if every person has their own. You know that, that I we that every person has a core. You know that is theirs, and the other person cannot necessarily, even if they're a therapist or mm-hmm. a guy or a priest or whoever they are, right? That uh, it has some some kind of we, we could idealize, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But I'm thinking about this mutual vulnerability of two people sitting together in a room. And they're together, but each of them is also separated. And each and the the one that is in the role of the patient, I want to call it, because we are all have been patients yeah. and some therapists, and right, and and we are we are in a position that is not symmetrical. It's a position when I have a role, mm-hmm. responsibility, but there is some mutuality, and the patient teaches me about themselves, and I am. A learner also in that mm-hmm. I learn who they are and listen as as much as I can, right? And I listen to them and I also listen to myself. I listen to my own voices. What, what do I say? I work with that too. What, what, what do I feel now? What is happening when I'm the, with this person? Is mm-hmm. that similar to what happens to that person with other people in the world? How do How do I understand that? Is it similar to the way... I am with other people in the world. You see, so there is something very um, multi-layered. I want to say mm-hmm. that meeting of minds. I'm also thinking about uh, some of the fascinating research that's happened about epigenetics and family mm-hmm. um, systems, you know, and yeah. and intergenerational trauma. I'm wondering if you could say something about that. You know, epigenetics is a, the research on epigenetics is a fascinating one. And I'll say in a few words what epigenetics is for those Mm -hmm. who are not familiar with that. Um, It is, it is a research that really looks at the biological mechanisms uh, by which trauma is transmitted from generation to generation. Uh, The impact of the, what we call the environment. In the environment, it means like the psychological environment and especially trauma on the expression of genes. Uh, it's almost like an environmental memory. Like some people, when they try to explain it, they say uh, it is. It's it doesn't change the genes, but it's almost as if the gene has a memory uh, mm-hmm. that originally is there to help the next generation survive when in the... Uh, in this research done um, with uh, animals, worms, and uh, mice who live four years, two years, they can they can research seven generations, and I, I I think in some of them even fourteen generations that adjust to the environment. And with humans, this research really started in the nineties. Uh, the whole idea of intergenerational transmission of trauma uh, started after the Holocaust and with Holocaust survivors and and uh, many of these the psychoanalytic uh, investigation before the epigenetics and neuroscience started in the late sixties and seventies when there was a second generation of Holocaust survivors. Mm-hmm. And many of these psychoanalysts were actually Holocaust survivors themselves and their patients were. And so it started like going back to me search as a me search. Yeah. People really feeling like, oh, I, I feel I grew up with these parents. Their trauma did not happen to me, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but I feel it. So how is that possible? And so you see that simultaneously it started, psychoanalysts started talking about it later on. There is the um, neuroscience that really trying and, uh, to understand, uh, to give an explanation, actually. It, it goes backwards. It starts with, with the research. It starts with people feeling, I, I know. And intuitively, you know, when you talk to people, they say, yeah, I know that my parents' experiences live inside me. I know it. I feel it. I don't understand it. So many of us, uh, you know, clinicians and researchers try to explain it. And epigenetics is, is one way that talks about uh, nature. Mm-hmm. And the other side is, of course, 
and nurture. And in the book, I talk about attachment and how the, uh, you know, the transmission of emotions, trauma is one of them, right? Raw emotions mm-hmm. that were not processed actually happen uh, through the attachment, through that unit of parent and child where children feel their parents and know their parents and react and they're like sponge quality of, of uh, children is what makes them know their parents so well, even without the parents mm-hmm. knowing them. I remember many times um, when I would teach with a friend of mine, Mark Epstein, who's a psychiatrist in, in New York city. And, uh, uh, he would he would quote uh, Winnicott mm-hmm. quite a lot, and then um, he would talk about uh, the good enough mother, and and make a point of saying that uh, I guess it was the fifties that um, Winnicott mm-hmm. was a British psychoanalyst, and the people presenting with their children were the mothers, you know. But yeah. what could say good enough parent? And uh, but he would talk about good enough mother, and then. Um, somebody would always in the in the group in the audience say, um, "What does that mean?" And then Mark would say, "It means someone who can survive their child's rage." Mm-hmm. And right. then somebody would ask, "How do you survive your child's rage?" And he said, "By not getting too kind of invasive, and also not getting withdrawn." Right, and not punishing. Yes. Uh, the- so, Martin Aitre is amazing that way, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's really about the parents uh, surviving uh, the child's, uh, when you could call it destruction, destructive urges. Mm-hmm. The child is going to try, you know, the, the, the child has their own aggression and how the parents does it not retaliate, mm-hmm. stays and survives. And there's something every time Mark said, you know, he goes through that and he says, you know, either get um, invasive nor withdrawn. Um, I love that idea of not punishing. I then say, well, that's what we call mindfulness, actually. <laughs> you know, it's it's a stance or it's a position or it's a relationship, really, yeah. to our experience that is neither um, overcome by it nor fighting against it, pushing it away. I love that. I love that, Sharon. It's beautiful because I think I'm thinking of it even visually, right? Staying steady, staying with something, it means you don't go forward or backwards. That's right. Right? You just stay where you are, grounded and and with it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and there's a kind of openness to that, and there's a kind of um, loving kindness to that. Mm. You know, because otherwise if you're just fighting against what you're feeling all the time, it's impossible. Like yes. those generations, you know um, – my parents' generation, like my father fought in World War II. Uh, but of course, that generation never spoke about that in general. And if you ask anybody about their parent who fought in World War II as an American soldier, it's sort of like, no, they just came home and drank, you know, or mm-hmm. something like that. Uh, as a way to not, to not talk about yeah, it and not, yeah. and not think about it, not only not talk, right, to not think about it. You know, so there's there's often just um, I'm just thinking about the relationship of the world and its values and what it promotes and what it tries to shut down, and the connection between that and our own individual process in moving toward healing because the experiences are happening. It doesn't matter if you don't talk about them. Um, I mean, it does matter, but it doesn't matter in terms of their existence or not. Exactly. Uh, but so much follows from that. And, and there is a connection to understanding and, and culture and so many yeah. things. Exactly. You know, I think in the book, when I talk about ghosts, right, and I talk, what is the, the experience of emotional ghosts? Mm-hmm. It's those things that are it's exactly what you're saying, is the things that are there, we feel them, but we don't, we can't talk about them and we don't see them mm-hmm. fully. Know them, but they're there, and so this whole idea that if we don't talk about something, it's not going to hurt us, right? As, as you said, it's there anyway, mm-hmm. and 
it, and of course, it is it is often very very hard, especially when it comes to trauma, to sit with it mm-hmm. because because it's painful. Mm-hmm. And so in therapy, and I'm sure in, in, you know, when you sit, you sit with it in, in a little bit, every time a little bit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you, you create a tolerance to actually talk about what happened mm-hmm. to you. What is it that is, was so painful and that you're so afraid of, right? And you, you see that the legacy of not talking uh, in the second and third generation, it's something we learn. We learn not to talk. We learn because we learn from our parents. And I mean, you and I, mm-hmm. uh, I would say, rebelled against mm-hmm. it to some degree, right? And we mm-hmm. learned to be ourselves and then others. But I think many people uh, that I see struggle with, are you sure that nothing will happen to me if I will let myself fully feel? Mm-hmm. Can, you, can you promise me that I'm not going to fall apart um, and there is the feeling that people say and um, you know i will never be able to forget it again mm-hmm. and then what if i want to for- i don't want to know it I, there is no i can't undo it so i rather not talk about it and not let it out when i was talking to somebody uh a psychotherapist about for the book that i'm writing now and, and uh talking about trauma he talked about um the process that some people go through uh, and uh, somewhere in that process toward, I hate to say the end, but, you know, so, somewhere toward some some place, you know, where you're not just in that initial grappling with what in the world is going on. And, and there's some resolution because you've seen things, maybe you've spoken about them, you've been able to relate to them a little differently and then a lot differently than you had in the past. And he said that people will say things like, um, the image of what happened still arises, but now it's more like a black and white photo at some distance, mm-hmm. rather than a, like a vivid movie that is, yeah. that I'm in, you know, that I, I can't get out of. So there's a sense of, you know, the recognition is there, maybe the imagery is there, the memories are there, but, there's more space. There's more spaciousness. Right. And that's the, the, the process, right? This is processing mm-hmm. experiences and reflecting on it. And, you know, Freud uh, had this German term that uh, is called Nachtraglichkeit. Uh, in English, it is translated to afterwardness, mm. which means uh, that we process experiences again and again every time from a different place. And uh, Freud actually wrote it originally about trauma, mm-hmm. actually, and about sexual abuse, because uh, he was talking about how when a child is sexually abused, uh, she can't really, uh, exp- she doesn't experience all the layers of what it means to be sexual abuse, right? Uh, in some, in the book, I have a chapter on confusion of tongues and how confusing that experience is. And then he says, then every time as she grows up and every developmental phase and every event that happens in her life, there would be another layer of processing. So when she's a teenager, then sexual abuse looks slightly different than as a child. And when, if you have a child and a child is the age that you have been when that happened, then Mm -hmm. you have another round of processing. So we are, and it's exactly, I think what you were saying is that we are, reprocessing it and processing it until again I don't think there is an end because uh, only when life ends Mm -hmm. because life goes on and we always revisit our experiences from different places well moving through the cycles of trauma in our own family can present very different challenges than other relationships in our lives and can you speak to that for a moment do you know I think that is related mainly to how uh, th- that families are the, the you know the original unit. You you're born into these uh, these attachments with, um, again, the people who raised you. It could be your biological parents. It could be your adoptive parents. It could be uh, your grandparents. Right. Uh, no matter who it is, the people that raise us are, are in, or our first attachment uh, figures are the most important people in our lives because they shape us. Mm-hmm. And so 
they might not be the most important in our life later on. And, you know, when we talk about if you don't want to talk to your parents, that doesn't mean that you get rid of them inside of yourself, mm-hmm. right? inside us, even without our permission. And our relationships and our uh, dialogues with others are in, uh, to some degree, is in dialogue with them, right? It's mm-hmm. like what you said before about uh, when when you see on TV an authority figure and you say, no, I, I don't, you know, mm-hmm. I don't like that, right? Mm-hmm. All of us, it is some in some way inside of us is related to the people that raised us. Mm-hmm. So I think that is always a point of reference. It's interesting. And then um, the last thing I want to ask you about is vicarious trauma, mm. because um, of the work I, you know, have done with the people in our societies we call caregivers, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, who are often on the front lines of suffering and, and dealing with intractable systems and trying to get people help and uh, yeah. facing a lot. And uh, just wondering if you could say something about that. Yeah, you know, this is really important because we're talking about people who are shattered by trauma mm-hmm. and people that witness right trauma. Mm-hmm. They're people like us who mm-hmm. listen to people's trauma or or even when we think about generational trauma, to some degree, children are witnesses of their parents' trauma when their parents overshare with them. Mm-hmm. You know, so we go back again to that uh, dialectic tension between too much and not enough. Mm-hmm. Secrets on one hand, not people that don't talk about anything. And on the other side... There is over uh, sharing, which is also, if we connect it to what we talked about before, it's about processing something through another person. Mm -hmm. And uh, to some degree, we all do that because we need another person in order to process Mm -hmm. things. And so I think that is a real thing that uh, in in the book, in the first chapter, I have uh, the story of Eve and Eve's grandmother died when her mother was young. Mm -hmm. She tells me about the last week of her mother's life and every detail about her mother, her grandmother, and how her grandmother and her mother who was 14 and a grandmother who was dying from cancer and how the grandmother looked and what happened and how the mother felt. So you see that in that chapter, Eve is telling me about her secondary trauma, mm-hmm. about about her, right, about her being traumatized uh, through her mother's trauma, because the sharing of all the details that the mother shared with her little girl Eve was something that traumatized her. Mm-hmm. So you see that that exists in in families as well. Um, it's, which is which is something we look at when we talk about generational mm-hmm, trauma. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much for this discussion, and uh, which you know uh, brings up a lot of hope, even as we mm-hmm. recognize, you know, kind of the vulnerability that so many people are experiencing. And uh, I think both the recognition and the um, realization, you know, of how many of us have a kind of vulnerability and that and that's normal you know that's like life and uh we can rely on a lot of methodologies and known um science actually in in terms of of healing and and we can rely on one another which is really wonderful um you closed your book with a wonderful passage that i'd like to read and then just have us uh, sit together for a few moments and uh, let it in. <gasps> so what you write is, when we can learn to identify the emotional inheritance that lives within us, things start to make sense and our lives begin to change. Slowly a door opens, a gateway between present life and past trauma. On our way to healing, that which seemed impossible now becomes tangible. The pain diminishes 
and a new path appears to love. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, to learn more about Galit's work, you can visit her website, which is galitatlas.com. It's G-A-L-I-T-A-T-L-A-S.com. And get a copy of Emotional Inheritance in paperback, ebook, or audiobook format wherever books are sold. Thank you to everyone who's listening. This has been the Meta Hour podcast from the Be Here Now Network. Hey folks, thanks for listening. To learn more about Sharon and her ongoing teaching schedule, as well as online courses and a free guided meditation, check out her website at SharonSalzberg.com.